Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to Seacoast. Glad you're here. I want to welcome those of you who are joining us uh, right now online or at an off-site campus or in the chapel, the warehouse, wherever you might be today. We're glad that you're here for Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. You say, well, you know, everyone, this is my 28th Mother's Day, okay? And so every once in a while somebody will say, well, why do we even talk about mother's stuff on Mother's Day? Is it really biblical? Is it, is there like Mother's Day in the Bible? And uh, so I looked at it. First, I'd say yes. And the uh, Bible says, honor your father and mother every day. And so why not take one day out of the year to do it? And somebody says, well, isn't it just a creation of Hallmark Company to spend money? So I looked it up, and the answer is basically yes. But that's all right. It's all right. So it's an honor to uh, honor not just mothers, but all the women in the house. How many of you think we ought to take at least one week out of the year and honor the women in the house? And so we're going to do that. So I thought I'd start with honoring the women in my life who have made me uh, who I am. And I've got to start with my mom. I'll show you a few pictures. Uh, This is a picture that was taken when we lived in Joplin, Missouri. And uh, my father, who's here on the front row in this service, it's him over here. This is actually off of an album cover. Do you remember albums, those vinyl things? Well, he made one. He sang and played a little bit, and he was kind of a traveling evangelist. In fact, they made a few thousand of these. And in fact, if you want one, I think he's got several hundred probably left. <laughs> and uh, this is our family. This is my mother. She's beautiful, absolutely beautiful lady. And, and uh, my little brother, Chris, lives in Nashville now. My sister, beautiful woman of God, she lives in Savannah. My brother, Jeff, who was here last week. And uh, this is John Travolta right here. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Um, this is another picture. This one's special because um, I was thinking today, out of about the last 35, 40 years, I spent one Mother's Day with my mother because I'm a pastor. Mother's Day, you're here and you preach and dad's a pastor. And so um, we took off in 1991 and went to Houston, Texas and just surprised mom for our first Mother's Day with mom uh, in years before and ever since. And, um, and so we surprised her and we went, went out for Mexican food. Mom loved Mexican food, which is why I look the way that I do, a little overweight right now. But uh, uh, it was just, it was a great, great Mother's Day. And she had this picture taken just before that. And uh, this was just two months before she died. Uh, five-year battle with cancer and she looked great. She was a fighter. This is my sister who also has gone through so much in her life, trusted God, and uh, uh, just, uh, just a real example of what a woman could be. And of course, this is Debbie, and uh, for this picture, she borrowed one of our neighbor's pigs. I don't know what that's all about, but she liked the picture. And uh, Debbie is an inspiration for all of us. She's the mother of the house. Uh, I like to say, if you looked up mother and grandmother uh, in the dictionary, there'd be a picture of her. Uh, most of you know we have 14 grandkids all live around us, so Saturdays are soccer. Oh my goodness, we have three soccer teams, and uh, fortunately it's just three. We've got four of our little six-year-old girls on the same team, so, uh, uh, but only less than half of the kids are playing soccer yet, so just pray for us. Our life is going to be crazy. And uh, last Saturday or a couple Saturdays ago, um, we, had to, we had games in two, di- two different locations, and so I was at the one location I left at halftime, left Debbie there, went to the other one. And when I went to the other location, the kids that were there do what they do. They came running to me. You know, they just run. You like to slow it down like a movie, but they just run. and They grab me, Papa. And then the first question was, where's Grandma? <laughs> and I'm like, who cares? You know, I mean, I, I'm here. <laughs> but she is a magnet. They just love her. And, and I love her. And uh, she's the mother of our house. And. And this is my oldest daughter, number three child, and Jessica, and uh, she's just an inspiration to me. She has four kids, and she works as a nurse, and she works at night. She works like the night shift. She's delivered, or helped deliver a lot of your kids here and taking care of them in the baby nursery at East Cooper Hospital. And I asked her, how do you do it? How do you work with those four kids, get sleep, 
and then work at night. She said, well, working at night's like getting away from, from the kids, so it's kind of it's good. But uh, she's an inspiration to me. And then this is my youngest daughter, Jenny, and uh, uh, she is tenacious. That's my daughter with attitude is what she is. And uh, uh, she has had a struggle that some of you have had with uh, infertility. And uh, we've probably shed more tears in her, her life uh, than probably probably with with any of our kids and um, she now is the mother of three beautiful children but yesterday uh, she posted something on Mother's Day and and, and so I'm driving uh, with Debbie home from a soccer game actually and Deb said did you see what Jenny posted and I said no read it to me major mistake because it, it, my eyes were leaking I want to read it to you today because I thought it was so apropos. She posted this. She said, this Mother's Day, I will celebrate being a mama to my precious ones. I will also celebrate my mom, who is an outstanding woman and who deserves to be celebrated. I agree. But I also want to celebrate the mamas who have yet to hold an earthly baby in their arms or have experienced the unthinkable loss of a child. I celebrate your courage and bravery as you face this weekend. You are my heroes in my book. For most of you, the phrase Mother's Day brings about the painful reminder of your loss. But I know this. You are mothers nonetheless. Your heart is loved deeper than you thought possible and experienced pain like no other. It's my honor to pray for you daily as I am reminded of your struggle. And I celebrate you and your little angels in heaven as I celebrate my three little angels there also. You are brave, you are fierce, and you are fighters. You are strong and your mothers. That would be a good time to applaud while I get myself together a little bit. (laughs) Jenny has allowed her hurt to become a blessing to other people and she now leads an infertility group uh, weekly to help uh, uh, women who uh, have the same struggle that that she has had. And then uh, this is my maniac mom. This is Jenna who is uh, my daughter-in-law, Jason's wife, and she is an adventurer. This is, I asked them to send me pictures that they wanted me to show when I told them I was going to show them. This is the one she wanted to represent her. And what it was is they were on a cruise, and it was formal night, so they're in formal attire. There was a climbing wall on the cruise boat, which was closed, by the way, and roped off. And she said, <laughs> she said Jason, this would be a great picture. Gave her camera to somebody and... and Climbed this, they're about halfway up a climbing wall, and uh, so pray for her children. Uh, <laughs> wow. And uh, she started a missional mom's group, and uh, we're just so proud of her tenacity. And it, a sense of adventure brings joy to our family. And uh, then this is Lisa, my daughter in law, who is Josh, who's the lead pastor here. It's his wife and uh, daughter, and, and her mother also. And uh, Lisa is a uh, capital L L L L L leader. She is leader, 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 leader. Probably has a bigger gift than any of us, and uh, she leads causes and always has, and will till the day she uh, goes to be with Jesus. She now her cause is focused on Seacoast Church, and I think you should feel very, very good about that. But uh, uh, because of her leadership and her gifts that she passed on to her children, she's raising three beautiful, strong-willed uh, children. God bless them. And uh, <laughs> does a great job, a great job uh, with, with that. And so those are, the, those are the women in my home. I wanted to share them with you for, for one reason, to show, show them to you, for another reason, to show you that our family goes through all the pain and heartache that every, every other family does. We don't post all about it on Facebook. But we, we, we do, and we have. We're human. We all, we, all, uh, we all are a part of this thing called life. Uh, the struggle is real, would you agree? And especially, uh, with, um, especially with, with women and, and mothers. So I, I got, got some quotes on motherhood. I love this. Uh, a Jewish proverb, God could not be everything and everywhere. Or God could not be everywhere, and therefore he made mothers. <laughs> if I'd read it right, it makes a lot more sense. But anyway, <laughs> Jewish proverb. This one is a Chinese proverb. It says, there is only one pretty child in the world, and every mother has it. <laughs> Would you agree with that? I have seen some of the most humble-looking children that moms thought were, 
really great. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Should I say that? <laughs> Some of them were our grandkids. Okay. <laughs> Have any of you had a cone head when you, they were first born? Yeah, okay. All right, here we go. Don't, hey, listen, don't send stuff to me. <laughs> Give me a break. I do this several times. <laughs> first time I've said that, I won't say it again. Here's another one. Irish proverb, a man loves his sweetheart the most, his wife the best. Now, time out. I hope those two are the same. It's an Irish proverb. Irish proverb, it's not me but his mother the longest. How many of you would agree with that? Such good stuff, such good stuff. Being a parent can be stressful. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, it really can. I, uh, I found an article, I was doing some research for this, and it talked a little bit about the stresses of motherhood that are unique to motherhood. Time demands, time demands. When, when you get an extra little person in your home or two or three persons or four or five persons, I talked to a guy yesterday that goes to the church, has eight little persons in their home. How do you know that most mothers feel a shortness of time? There's laundry, there's playtime, there's science projects, there's cleanups. Motherhood, I read this, motherhood is a job that you will never lay your head on a pillow and say everything has got done today. It's just that's the way it is. Uh, finances cause stress. Um, whether it's, you know, uh, a, a, a nanny or daycare or you choose to give up an income and stay at home, you're going to have financial stress uh, as a parent. And it's just the way it is. Relationship demands. You know, you've got these kids and they're constant. And then the, if you're married, uh, actually uh, the guy that helped create those kids needs some time too. And, and it's, I thought that was a great way of saying it, but may, maybe not. But anyway, uh, and so there, that stress. And then you've got protective instincts. Uh, moms, you know what this is like. When, when you get a child, when, when your first child, suddenly they, you, you become a parent, suddenly the world becomes a dangerous place. How do you know that? You know, what, what are they putting in their mouth? You know, or who are they hanging around with? It can't be driver's license time, yet they're not ready. You know, or what if they make bad choices? It, it, speaking of choices, I found this quote. I love this one. This is Harry S. Truman. He says, I have found the best way to give advice to your children is to find out what they want and then advise them to do it. And so, <laughs> I thought that was good. Uh, practical. Anyway, uh, self-doubt. So many moms deal with self-doubt. It's a fear most mothers have that they're not doing a good enough job, you know. I'm going to make a mistake that will mess up their lives and all that. And can I tell you, and I'll tell you this again later, um, God's not telling you that. That's the accuser of your soul. That's not a message from God. That's the accuser of your soul. And so you've got self-doubt, and then, and then you've got time alone. What's that like? When, remember when you were single, or remember before you had kids, uh, you, you could have times, time alone, and you resent it when Mary Helen posts pictures on Facebook and Instagram from the spa or her long weekend at the beach without kids. You're going, what's up with that? Who gets to do those things? And it all adds up to stress. And so the question is, what does stress do? What does stress do? I was looking at Mayo Clinic information online, and, and we all know, but uh, just, just a few things. It, 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 it impacts everything. A little, little bit of stress is good for you. I mean, there's no such thing as living a stress-free life. You know, that's a pipe dream, not going to happen, not even created that way. You grow when you're stretched a little bit. But chronic stress is very, very dangerous. It impacts your body. Uh, you know, you can get sick, uh, headaches, muscle tension, sleep problems, stomach upset. You guys have all experienced that. Affects your mood. Uh, when you're stressed, you get uh, restless, you get irritable, um, you know, anxiety, uh, sadness, depression, all of those types of things. It also Im it affects your behavior, uh, depending on how you're wired up. When you're stressed, you, you might overeat or undereat. You know, I tend to, if I get stressed, I, I go eat stuff. You know, I'm trying to lose weight right now. I woke up this morning with a dream of chocolate cake, and that was stressful. <laughs> it really did. That's true. Um, you can get angry, uh, use alcohol, tobacco, uh, don't exercise, all of those types of things. That's what stress does. So what do you do about it? That's the question. What do you do about it? 
Let me give you a couple suggestions. You could do this. You could buy something. This is shampoo. Actually, I took a picture in our shower. That's why all the stuff is on. I've got some right here. This stuff's great. It's called stress relief. You know, it's got those essential oils, which, by the way, cure everything these days, <laughs> uh, apparently. Um, this one, Debbie buys this stuff. This, this one has eucalyptus spearmint. And so when you put this on, uh, I, there is no stress in the shower. It is absolutely, <laughs> absolutely incredible. The problem is, is when you get out of the shower, you, you still have stress. And I don't know, maybe you carry it with you in your car, put a little on your head. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know. But that's an option. I just want to give you all the options. Uh, there are better ones. Actually, let's ask this. What, is, what does God say about stress? Because he talks about it. Now, I'm going to be talking to you in the next few minutes to the women, the men, the singles, students. Everybody deals with stress. You make your own application. I'll make more of them to women today than, uh, than, than the other groups. But uh, if you're stressed a little bit, you'll, you'll get something out of this. What does the Bible say? Because it does talk about it. Here's the number one scripture on stress in the Bible, I think. It's Jesus in John chapter 14. And verse 27, and he's praying for his followers, and he says this, peace. Can you say peace? peace. What's the opposite of stress? Peace. peace. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. It's a gift. Jesus said, I want to give you a gift that counteracts the stressful lifestyle that you live. So I give you my peace. I do not give it as the world gives, essential oils, like this, on your head. These are good, though, for the shower. They really are. This is long-lasting, though. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. What happens when you get afraid? Stress. Stress. So he says, I give you peace. And so what I want to do, so I want to talk for a few minutes about the Bible's antidote to a mother's stress. And, uh, and I'm going to give them to you. I'm going to give you just three. There can be many. I'm just going to give three because I just have a few minutes. And I'm going to give you in reverse order of what I think they are. And you'll understand in a minute why I do the reverse order here. But, but just, just stick with me. Here's the first one. And that's this, laugh more. Laugh more. When you're stressed, the Bible says laugh more. Here's where it says it. In Proverbs 17 and verse 22. Would you read this one out loud together for me? A cheerful heart. You ever had a broken spirit? You just didn't feel like you could do anything? You're stressed out. It says in that situation, you know what the best thing you could do is laugh? A cheerful heart is good medicine. You remember when you were a kid, anybody else? Remember when, when we used to, like, cook cakes? Rather, now we go to Harris Teeter, you know, but remember back when mom used to cook a cake and she'd, uh, she'd make the icing in a beater and then you'd lick the, remember licking those? Anybody ever remember doing that? Yeah. Somebody said a good mother lets you lick the beaters when they're making a cake. A great mother turns the mixer off first. <laughs> Is that good medicine? That's good. Okay, I got a couple more. I got a couple more. I save these things, believe it or not. I've got a file for all this stuff. I found this. I found these up. You ever seen Maxine Krabby Road? These are so good. Here's Maxine. She's just, I love her. She's just crabby. I love it. She says, want your kids to call you on Mother's Day? Post something embarrassing about them on Facebook. Isn't that good? <laughs> That's a good one. On Mother's Day, your family will do anything you ask. Of course, the following day, you'll have to redo it all. <laughs> That's Debbie. That's Debbie. That's her, okay? Here's one. On Mother's Day, your family will wait on you hand and foot. Hopefully, they'll still remember how from last year. Now, I really like this one. It's my favorite. I've got soft spots for moms. My other soft spots are from eating too much. <laughs> Isn't that good? Humor. What humor does. I was studying that a few weeks ago, and um, there's a guy that... Uh, that uh, Norman Cousins, Dr. Norman Cousins, who was on the staff of UCLA Medical, and he, he was diagnosed with incurable 
degenerative disease. In other words, he's not going to get better. It's worse every day. And so he self-prescribed three things. Exercise, endorphins get going. Exercise make you feel better anyway or think better. Vitamin C. And uh, the unusual one was uh, uh, Marx Brothers shows and cartoons. And so he l locked himself into a hotel for a long extended stay and just watched cartoons all day long and just laughed and laughed and laughed. And ultimately he recovered and he found that 10 minutes of humor translated into one hour of pain-free. He wrote books, but he said that it's what humor does. It reduces pain. Here's some science to it. Our bodies produce pain-killing hormones called endorphins in response to laughter. Uh, also, it strengthens the immune uh, function. A good belly laugh increases production of T-cells, interferon, and immune proteins called globulins. I just feel smarter saying this stuff. And then uh, another one is it decreases stress. Interesting here, when under stress, we produce a hormone called cortisol, and laughter significantly lowers cortisol levels and returns the body to a more relaxed state. So the Bible didn't even read his study and says a cheerful heart. Laughter is like good medicine. The other night we were out, Debbie and I were out with some friends, and uh, we, uh, we, um, we ended the night at Starbucks, we usually do, and we're just in there talking. And Debbie started laughing about something. Now, you, th those of you who know her, she's quiet, reserved, uh, but she started laughing. And usually when she laughs really hard, it's at me. It's not about me. It's something I've said or done or whatever. So she started laughing, and she started laughing so hard she started crying. Have you ever done that? I know it's a good day when I can get her snorting. That's when it's just like, <laughs> it's all over, but it's good. So what do you do practically? Let me just give you a few things. Practically, you can humor up your work environment, you know, put some funny stuff around. Um, you can create a humor file. I do that. Um, you can watch less Fox News and a lot more Seinfeld reruns. <laughs> That's good for you in a lot of ways. Um, go bowling. Just do something kids like. You know, just do something fun every once in a while. Laugh at yourself. Everybody else says you might as well. Okay? So those are, those are some laughter things. This, this week, uh, we had a very... Uh, you know, challenging. You want to rejoice on one side, but it's sad on the other. And Pastor Vern Jensen went to be with the Lord, 83 years old. And uh, somebody said, was that a hard memorial service? I said, no, it was a graduation. We celebrate that. But Migsy is, is left, you know, without her, her spouse. And uh, she's by Vern's side as he slipped into eternity. And uh, I, I thought, you know, Migsy will grieve, but she's going to be okay because she has strong faith, a close network of friends and family, and she has a great laugh, if you know Migsy, that just lights up a room. And it's just a healthy, healthy thing. So you have a choice. You can continue to be a grown-up and let all the frustrations and disappointments in life weigh you down, or you can let a smile be your umbrella. And if you do, you're likely to enjoy each day to its fullest and spend less time in the doctor's office. So if you're stressed, Bible says laugh more. Here's the second thing it says is release worry. Release worry. Um, anybody ever worry at all? Okay, all right. Here's some worry quotes. I found this one on Debbie's Facebook page this week. I loved it. Corey Ten Boom. Anybody know anything about Corey Ten Boom? Rough life, uh, World War II, uh, Nazi, Nazi persecution, all that kind of stuff. And here's what she says. Worry does not empty tomorrow of its troubles. Uh, it empties today of its strengths. That's good, isn't it? Let's, look at this one. I love this one. A day of worry is more exhausting than a week of work. Anybody have a testimony to that? Yeah. I love this one. Worrying is like sitting in a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, English proverb. So what do you do? What should you do about worry. Here's what the Bible says. Read this one out loud for me. Give most of your work. Oh, hang on. I got it wrong. <clears throat> Let's do it again. Give some of your... Wow. Does that say all? Could you circle that in your notes? Put an arrow to it. God wants you to live worry-free. Can't be stress-free. You're going to have stress, but you should not have hang on to worries. It says give, let, let's read it again. Give all Yeah. Some versions say cast 
your care upon God. Release, give all, give all, give all. In the original Greek, all means all y'all in southern language, all. All y'all give all your worries to God. How do you do that? I mean, do you have any worries that hang around? I mean, even after you pray about them, say, God, I'm worried about this, I give it to you, and 20 minutes later you're thinking about it again, or the next day, or anybody have that testimony at all? Anybody? Okay. I want to help you. Two things. Number one, tell yourself the truth. And here's the truth. The truth is that 99% of everything you worry about will never happen. Okay? Anywhere from 95 to 99% studies tell us will never, ever happen. So that ought to help. But you're obsessing over the one thing, which is a real thing. It's your health. It's your kids' health. It's finances. It's what, And it's real. It's out there. How do you give that to God? How do you release your worries to God? Let me give you something that this may be the best thing that you hear today. Write it down, okay? Have a notebook, a journal. I do it online, because I'm a geek that way. Maybe you have an old school little notebook you carry around, whatever. Write it down. Write everything you're worried about. Write your worries down, okay? And then at the bottom of the page, then write this, transferred to God, date, and then sign it, okay? So here's my worry. Here's what I'm worried about. I'm gonna give it to God transferred to God this date and sign it. And then here's what you do. Next time you think about that, you say this, God's got this. God's got this. I'm not going to take it. The quicker you move from what am I going to do to God's got this, the quicker you lower your stress level. So laugh more. Give away your worries. Here's the third one. Find faith. This is actually the first one but I wanted it here because I wanted to talk about it just before response time. If you're going to lower your stress, you've got to look at your life through eyes of faith. If you're going to lower your stress, you've got to have eyes to see life through eyes of faith. The, the other day I was on an airplane. seems like my life these days. And uh, I probably was waiting on a runway in Atlanta, which is like a traffic jam in New York City. And so I got out my Bible, which was on my iPad, and I just started reading Galatians. And I was there long enough to read all the way through the fifth chapter, and a verse jumped out at me. Have you ever had that happen? So a verse jumped out, and it, it was this. The only thing that counts, the, say only with me, only. The only thing that counts on the scoreboard of life the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You know, there are a lot of churches, a lot of Christians that think that the, the, the epitome of maturity is how much you know. You know, do you know this? Do you have a sound doctrine? All of that. That's all good. The Bible says that knowledge puffs up. It says love builds up. It says the, the sign of maturity is not what you know, it's who you love. I've talked about that before. You love God? How are you doing with that? You love yourself? How are you doing with that? You love your neighbor that's like you? How are you doing with that? How about your neighbor that's not like you? How about your neighbor that doesn't like you? How are you doing with love? But it begins, the only way you can do it, that's a, that lowers your stress. The only th way you can do it is with faith. Okay? The only thing that counts is faith. So what is faith that expresses itself through love? There's three kinds. The first kind is saving faith. Saving faith. And uh, what does that mean? That means this. It says, Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith. We're not made right because of what we do or don't do. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to sin. You're going to say things that you shouldn't say. Sometimes do things you shouldn't do. That's not what makes you right in God's sight. What makes you right in God's sight it's faith. Faith in what? We have peace. There it is. Jesus' gift, the very first verse I said, in exchange for stress, he wants to give us peace. We have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. What has he done? He died on the cross so that you and I could be forgiven of all of our sin. That's the gospel. He died on the cross so you and I 
could be forgiven of past sin, current sin, future sin. Future sin, okay? Here, here's another way of looking at it. It says, but God has showed us how much he loves us. How do you know how much God likes you? How, much, how do you know how much God loves you? Maybe this week you had a bad day. Maybe your day was like this, Mom. You're on your way to work, got the kids off to school, you're on your way to work, and you get a flat tire. And so you're late to work, and when you get to work, you find out you didn't get the promotion somebody else did. And you thought you deserved it. About that time, somebody from home calls you and says, you remember the, you remember the leak that we had in the dishwasher a year ago? Well, it's leaking again, and it ruined our floors again. You rush home, and you get home, you get a call from school. What's the worst call that you get from school? Your kid has lice, okay? <laughs> it's going to ruin your life for several days. And so you begin to hear a voice in your head that says, does God really love you? So that's how, that's, that's how, that's how much God loves you. If he loves you so much, why are all these things happening to you? Perhaps you're asking the same questions today and it's not the things that I talked about. Maybe it's something else. A series of things and you wonder, does God love you? Can I say this? Never measure God's love by looking at your circumstances. You measure God's love by looking at the cross. Because it says, God has shown us how much he loves us. How? It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. While you didn't deserve it, while you were thumbing your nose at God, maybe you really were or you just were ignoring him. Doesn't matter. Before the foundations of the earth, God knew the choices you would make. Some of them would break his heart. But he chose to give his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross so that you could have peace. Peace with God and peace in your circumstances. If you want to measure how much God loves you, measure how wide Jesus had his arms spread on the cross. That's saving faith. And, uh, and, and, and the first, first way to lower stress is to receive the gift of God, the peace that comes through Jesus Christ. And hopefully you've done that. If not, we'll give you an opportunity to change your life, change your life. Okay, here's the second kind of faith, and it's strengthening faith. It's strengthening faith. It's that faith that you need. Have you ever had one of those days where you feel like, I don't know if I can get through this? I, I don't know if I've got enough energy to do what I need to do today. I, I'm not sure that I'm gifted to be a mother. I look at somebody else, and there are mothers that do it so much better than I do. And I'm just not getting it right. Again, those voices are not coming from your father. Those voices are coming from the accuser of the brethren and the sisters. Okay? But you have days like that. And so you need strengthening faith. And so you call out to God, and God gives you maybe this scripture right here, which says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the truth. There's nothing that you will face tomorrow, this coming week, or this next month or two. In fact, for the rest of your life. But what you can't do. You can do it. You can do it through the strength, the Holy Spirit. God gives the Holy Spirit. You call out on him and you say, God, fill me again with your Holy Spirit. I receive your strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Strengthening faith. You need another faith. You need sustaining faith. And th 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 those are the days when you had a miscarriage. Those are the days when you had a child. It was wayward. Had something happen that you can't believe. Those are the days when the surprise is so intense that you don't know if you'll be able to make it through another day. On days like that, you need sustaining faith, and it looks like this. Here's the evidence of it, Romans 8, 28. And we know, not we think or we hope, we know that in all things, everything, whatever it was that just happened to you or happened to you three months ago or five years ago, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. He has been, and who have been called according to his purpose. Can I tell you a story? So, 
So this past week, I, uh, not this week, the week before, um, I spoke at a conference in California on a Thursday. And uh, then I was speaking the, the weekend at an ARC church, association of related churches. We plant churches. And uh, we planted <laughs> almost 580 churches now, which is exciting. And one of those that was planted 10 years ago is having its 10 year, 10 year anniversary. So exciting, that church, just a little note on it, they struggled along, struggled along, we helped them, and, uh, and, and they've grown to over 1,000 people in, in just 10, 10 years, and it's just healthy, and I, I preached there this past, or I spoke this past weekend. And uh, it's in Springfield, Missouri. They said, hey, if you'll come in a day early, come in on Friday instead of Saturday, then we'll treat you to a fishing trip on Friday. How have you know that's my love language? Okay? And they've got largemouth bass there in a big lake. and So I, I was all excited about that. So I came in. Saturday morning, I wake up, and the wind's blowing, and it's rainy. At my age, you don't go fishing on days like that. I was talking to somebody in the foyer. They said, you know, I used to just put on a raincoat. No more. It's got to be nice. Okay. And so I'm faced with a day in a hotel in a small town with nothing to do. And I felt a prompting of the Holy Spirit. I said, call your friend. I had a friend three and a half hours away. And he's just had some devastating things happen in his life. A pastor, sin in his life. Uh, he's just, he's lost everything, everything. It's devastated, absolutely devastated. Lower than low can be. And so I called him up. I said, hey, you want to have lunch? So I've got kids' soccer games or whatever, baseball and me. I said, yeah, I got time for lunch. Are you in town? And I said, kind of. And uh, so I asked the people where I, at, where I was at, hey, instead of, the, instead of the fishing trip, how about you rent me a car? So they rented me a car, and I took a car, drove three and a half hours, had lunch, drove three and a half hours back, and uh, one hour lunch and came home. And uh, when I, I sat down with my friend, and he was just, he was wearing it, wearing a head, didn't want anybody to see him, just in such shame and just devastated. And it was interesting. He said, when he found out where I was, he said, why did you drive three and a half hours for a one-hour lunch and three and a half hours back? And I said, because that's what love does. If, if, if I would have known before I was married that I could spend an hour with Debbie, I'd have driven five hours and come back. That's what love does. That's what love does. And, uh, and so we were talking a little bit. I, I talked to him about the fact that God had called us and he had saved us and that was awesome and we reminisced a little bit about that. And then I told him, I said, you know, uh, I said, what, I just kind of reviewed what I was going to say here. I said, you need, some, you need some strengthening faith right now. I know you don't see it, but you, you've, God's going to give you the power every day to walk through what you need to walk through right now. And then you're going to need sustaining faith and sustaining faith says this, says that God's going to take your life and your choices and he's going to turn it around for your good. And uh, I could see he was having a hard time tracking with it because he just felt so bad. And I said, you know, the story of Moses, I remember reading the story of Moses a few years ago. You know, Moses raised in the Pharaoh's palace. He's going to be a leader. He kills a guy, makes a major mistake, and uh, alienates Pharaoh and the Israelites. Everybody hates him. 40 years old, he has to run to a foreign country where he knows nobody. He goes to a Starbucks. Actually, it was a well, but it was kind of like a Starbucks. <laughs> and he's sitting down by the well, it says, and he's just totally discouraged. And what he doesn't know is that he's soon to meet his future wife. God's going to use him to lead his country out of bondage in a few years. He's going to go up to the top of a mountain. He's going to see God face to face. God's going to give him the Ten Commandments. And here's the important thought, is that while he's sitting there feeling like his life is over because of a mistake he'd made, that he hadn't even done what he would be known for yet. And I told my friend that. And I said, do you believe? And he gave an answer, kind of like the guy that Jesus wanted to heal him in the New Testament. And Jesus says to him, do you believe I can? And he says, well, I'd really like to, but I'm having a hard time believing right now. Can you help me with my unbelief? And so I explained to my friend, I said this, I said, you know what? At Seacoast, we have a response time at the end of all of our messages, and we take communion, and we go to the cross and all that. But one of the cool things is that along the back walls, 
we have prayer teams. And those prayer teams were established initially by Vern Jensen, who was our pastor, who was over that. And he trained people how to pray. And we get people that are full of faith on the wall to pray for people. And I had a revelation a few years ago uh, about James 5, which is where that comes from, where it says, uh, are there any sick among you? Let him call the elders of the church. And, and uh, the prayer of faith, anointed with oil and the prayer of faith will save the sick. And I said, I, I got this revelation that sometimes people that come for prayer are so wounded by life that they just don't have faith. And that scripture doesn't say they have to have faith. It says they can borrow somebody else's faith, that the elder, the ones that pray, it's their prayer that gets them through. And I said, here's what I'm going to do for you, pal. You don't have faith right now? You can borrow a little bit of mine. Borrow a little bit of mine. He texted me a little bit later. And he said, you know what? It meant so much. But he said, buddy, I'm going to need to borrow some of your, some of your faith. And I gladly give it to him. Because I can believe for a great future for him. Well, Mom, you may be here today. And you may be overwhelmed by sadness and grief. Maybe what you needed to hear was that a merry heart does good. Maybe God's gift to you today is a little bit of laughter. Maybe you got a little bit here, and maybe after you go out, you'll get some more, know that it's good for you. Maybe another mother here that's really overwhelmed by worry about your own health or some of your kids, some of the choices they're making, or it could be anything. And what you need to do is get that revelation that you're going to write it down and give it to God and say, God's got this. For some of you, you need faith. You need saving faith. Maybe you need strengthening faith. Maybe you need sustaining faith. And maybe you just need to go to a prayer team and say, you know, can I borrow some of your faith today? It's here. And it's available. And God loves you. And God has great plans for your life. Can we pray? Father, I thank you for your kingdom. I thank you for the fact that you love this group of people so much. You cared for us. You sent Jesus Christ to die for us that we might have peace. His peace, your peace. It's a peace that during conflict it passes all understanding. It's a peace that helps us to know that we are in right relationship with you. It's a peace that lets us know that we have what it takes to do whatever we're called to do in this station in life. God, I pray that you would grant that peace to each of us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.